Another thing, uh, I believe, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I do want to say this, that I believe Jesus wants to build his church on revelation knowledge. Yes. And uh, what that means is I believe that Christian leaders have a responsibility before God to hear his voice and implement what he says to do. And I'm not really against going to the latest and greatest move of God in the town or the latest and greatest move of God in Brownsville or wherever God's doing stuff and, and taking some notes and gleaning some things from that. But ultimately, I really believe that each one of us as Christian leaders, we individually have to hear from God for ourselves, for our own ministry. Because when you really look at the church in the United States as a whole, it's failing the culture. The church is not doing a good job as a whole. Now, I believe there are pockets of victory. There are pockets of greatness in the church today. But as a whole, when you really analyze the numbers, you look at the moral decline of our nation, you know. I mean, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but I mean, you'd have to have your head in the sand not to already know these things I'm talking about. But I believe that God loves the church, and he loves the lost. And the Bible says that he wills that not one would perish, but that all should come to repentance. So in my spirit, I believe that God is going to send a third great awakening across the United States of America. That we're going to see thousands and thousands and thousands of people come to Christ. Now, I believe that, and, and I've used some of my own uh, terminology, and, and sometimes you've got to be careful with your own unique nomenclature because you, you lose people, but I like this one anyway, so I'm gonna, I'm, I've got my surfboard ready. And the wave is coming, and I, I've never, I'm really no surfer. I've never even surfed, but I've done some stuff in the waves, you know, like boogie boards and all that. But basically, you have to watch and wait, and, and a good surfer can tell you, hey, there's a good wave coming. They don't surf every single wave that comes by. They wait for the good wave. They wait for the right wave. And then when that wave comes, they begin to paddle, and they begin to prepare, and they begin to do some things. And so this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about paddling and how to prepare for the wave that I believe is imminent. Yes. I believe it's coming. Now, let me say this, too. In the midst of this incredible move of God, there's a possibility that we'll see incredible distress in our land, in the natural, in natural things. But the church, in the midst of that distress, will blossom and thrive and overcome and be glorious and do amazing things. So, again, I'm, I believe where sin abounds, God's grace abounds all the more. And so, again, in the midst of difficulties and challenges, I believe the church can have her finest hour. And I believe... Um, this is happening, and this is going to come. So what that means is that there are going to be people that come into our church who are hurting, and they are wounded, and they have wasted their time in the world. They have squandered their time. They have, they have gone out because of whatever reason, and they, in their own mind it's been all justified, and they've got it all figured out. But anyway, they've gone out into the world, and they've, they've, they've been squandered. A wasteful. They've wasted their most precious commodity on themselves. They've just been selfish and self-centered. And, and they're coming into the church. Now, how many of you know that that's wonderful? Okay, Shelly knows it's wonderful. Does anybody else think that's wonderful? That those people are coming into the church? Okay, good. Because I think in principle and theory, we need to embrace that idea that this is wonderful. This is God's thing. But I got news for you. One of those people just might take your parking place. One of those people might just take your chair. Your, you know, your holy chair that you donated 100 years ago, $43 to pay for your own chair, and you, this is my chair, ain't nobody taking it and all that. So we've got to be ready to have God's perspective on these prodigals because they might talk too much. They might be overly talkative. They, they might have a little B.O. That stands for body odor, you know. You know, I mean, there's these, all these kinds of dynamics that we think, you know, in our, in our theological pre predispositions, we think, we want the lost to come in. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. We want the church packed and full. But do we? Are you prepared for what that really means? Are you ready to not be fed and work in the nursery? I'm just, I'm just saying. Because when people come to the church, they're going to have children. So it's in theological principle, it's glorious and wonderful. But in a real practical way, we must prepare our hearts to receive 
the reality of what that means. Because if our hearts aren't ready, we'll abort our destiny as a church. We will lose our future. That's right. I, and I don't want to do that. No. So I want to share a word with you today. I want to talk to you about God's response to the lost coming home in Luke 15. If you have your Bibles, just turn there to Luke 15. And uh, God has feelings and opinions about lost people coming home. And I think as his people, we should reflect his, his feelings and his opinion. But I know from my understanding of the scriptures and from some of the things I've seen in the real world, you know, in practical everyday life, that not every time do we perfectly reflect the feelings of God as his people. So today I want to kind of dial us in a little bit and tune us in to, to resemble his heart so we have it. Because again, we don't want to miss the day of his visitation or the season of his visitation. There's a, there's a parable that Jesus is going to tell here in Luke, uh, Luke 15, verses uh, 1 through 7, about sheep. And there's a reason he's telling this parable. The reason he's telling this parable and these, these next two parables is because he's been uh, confronted by some other people. We call them Pharisees or the religious establishment, you know, the teachers of the law. They've confronted Jesus about something he's been doing. They don't like it. It irritates them. And because he's done this, they've judged him, and they've put him in a category maybe as unspiritual. They've put him in a category as, uh, oh, disgusting, you know, because he's doing something. Let's look at what he's doing. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Okay, so how many of you know that Jesus could be offensive at times? And when Jesus was offensive, it was because he was revealing something inconsistent in the heart of the offended. Yeah. Jesus never offended people just because it was fun for him or he got a kick out of it. He was a strategic offender. And Jesus would offend people and rub them the wrong way, I believe, on purpose, strategically, for the purposes of their ultimate redemption. Because he wanted to confront heart issues and heart concepts and heart ideas in the minds of people. So here you go. Jesus hears this muttering. What's muttering anyway? <laughs> Is that muttering? You know, that's kind of what I pictured as this, this childish man. If you've got something to say, man up and say it. Don't mutter. You know, just say it. <laughs> He's a real prophet. He wouldn't hang out with a senior. Oh, really? Well, let me tell you a little story. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep in verse 4 and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Okay, so now you're going to be the local pastor of a local church, and you've got 100 people in your church. And you believe it's important for the lost to be saved. God has put that desire in your heart from your understanding of Scripture and from your, your time in the presence of God. He's spoken to you that this is very important to His heart. And so consequently, you begin to move out in what some people would call evangelism or outreach or soul winning or whatever terminology you want to give it. But Sister Wilhelmina has got a need in your church. So what, is the, what's, what are you to do as the pastor? Are you to say, Sister Wilhelmina, I can't, I can't help you. I've got to go do this for a while what do you choose what do you decide well wouldn't it be wonderful if sister Wilhelmina could take care of herself as a Christian person yeah. she had gotten to the place in her Christian life where she was no longer vitally dependent upon the radical attention of a Christian leader now I get it not everybody's there there are people that are radically dependent on the immediate attention of a Christian leader. But I believe that 
God rejoices over the one and leaves the 99 yeah. to go get that one. Now, if you're, if you're doing math, you know, you might think, well, that's not a very, that's not a very good, his prior, God's priorities are kind of mixed up. Don't you think he should just leave the one and let the one wander off and get eaten by wolves? And stay with, you know, stay with the 99, you know, cut his losses. And what, what if he's out looking for the one and another one leaves? Well, that's not what God does. He goes after that lost sheep. And I believe when he finds that sheep, he rejoices. And he calls in all the neighbors. Rejoice with me. He brings the sheep in around his neck. There's all kinds of stories about this. He brings in the sheep around his neck. Hey, everybody, let's party. Rejoice. Hey, can we just rejoice for a minute? Yeah. Just give a hoot, you know? Just rejoice. Yeah, yeah man. We can just, let's just, we've got to rejoice sometimes, you know? And uh, there's so much strength in that. The next thing he tells these muttering Pharisees, it's about a parable about a lost coin. And this one will flip over your theological cart if you're a first century Jew. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Yes. So now it's not a hundred to one, it's ten to one. But guess what? The authority figure in the story who represents God is a woman. You remember I told you Jesus likes to offend the, the mind to reveal the heart. I think he chose a woman in, on purpose. To kind of zap those guys. They were probably falling apart when he said that. But praise God. It's okay. So again, we see, that we see this rejoicing over the sinner who repents. Now, let's look at Luke 15, 11 through 32. And I'm not going to read the parable of the lost son, as it's called in my Bible. I believe it should be called the parable of the loving father. But in this story, you've got two sons. One's, one's a homebody, and one's an adventurer, if you will. And the one son, I believe he's a little younger, he comes into his father and he says, Dad, you're not dead yet, but I want my half of your inheritance now. Now, how many of you think this guy, this guy's a, a scumbag? I mean, can you imagine walking into your mother or father who you're supposed to honor and love and respect and saying, you know what, you're getting kind of old, but you're not dead yet, so give me my half of the estate. I, wanna, I want it now. Man, this guy's a scumbag. This guy's a mess. But the father says, okay, I'll give you your half of the estate. He gives it to him, and I don't know what, what form. I assume it was in coins something like that, because he takes it with him. He leaves the country, goes away on a long journey, partying, wild living, hanging out with the prostitutes, just, man, indulging the flesh, selfish, self-centered. Just a pretty bad dude all the way around. So, how many you know sin is pleasurable for a season? Hebrews tells us that. So this season is coming to an end for this young man. And there's a famine in this foreign country where he goes. And because of the famine, the economy begins to falter and collapse. And so he takes a job as some kind of sharecropper, some kind of pig farmer assistant. And he begins to, his job is to feed pigs. Now, if you know anything about Jewish culture, this is not a, this is not a glorious job. Feed, you know, even getting around pigs and touching them. If you've ever been on a pig farm, they usually don't smell very good. Not to mention the fact that the pigs are ceremonially unclean. And so this is, this is a detestable position that this guy finds himself in. And so he's, he's, he's so broke. He's so rock bottom. He's in the gutter of life. He's, got, he's, got, he's drawn this conclusion. He says, man, I'm so hungry. I want to eat pig pods. Now, I've never, I've never, as a matter of fact, yesterday I went with a guy to buy some uh, pig feed. But it was in a bag, so I didn't get to look at it. But apparently pigs will eat just about anything. They're omnivores. You can throw anything at them, and they'll eat it. So these pig pods are probably some kind of cellulose-rich, hard-to-digest seed of some kind. And, and 
you know, can you imagine just like saying, man, I want to eat a piece of bark. I'm so hungry, I'll eat a piece of bark. But then the Bible talks about him, the epiphany, or he comes to his senses. And he says, man, I'm a doofus, you know. Here I am, living like this. And the empl- my dad's employees, the people that work on my dad's property, eat better and live better than I'm living. And the, and the boy knows what's right. The boy knows what's just. What's right and just is, I've given, I've lost my inheritance. So, it would be wrong for me to go back and expect anything but to be a servant in my father's house. And he gets it right, doesn't he? That's really right. I mean, he's, he, he's on target now. He's, he's come to his senses. He's not in this, this crazy, irrational me, me, me state, but now he's, he's hit rock bottom. He's realized some things. How have you noticed that happens to people? Yeah. You know what I've noticed about people? Everybody's got a different rock bottom. Yeah. Some people, you know, they have, a, they have a bad day, and man, they're crying out to Jesus for mercy, you know. Other people, man, they're, I mean, they're, they are a complete disaster. Everything in their life is falling apart, and they're like, I got this. You know, they're walking around, they're walking around with one shoe on. They don't got this, but they think they got this. I got a friend that showed up to the Chicago Teen Challenge with one flip flop. Can I tell you, when you're walking around with one flip flop, you need help. <laughs> Bless his heart, good brother, got saved, came home. So the son comes home, and I love this story because it's my story. And uh, I love to think about God's love. And we sang about it so often this morning. It was beautiful. It's just precious. And I like to think about how this father, I like to think, I'm a father, you know. So I think about life, and I think about children, and I think about family, marriage, and all that kind of stuff quite a bit. And, I was, um, you know, you're thinking about justice and how angry parents, you know. How many of you know this might make you a little angry with your child you know it might make you a little upset with the, way, the choices they made and how they ruined their life and took half of your net worth down the tubes for nothing what do they have to show for it nothing but the father what overshadows all of the justice and all the demands for retribution and judgment is his love and mercy it overshadows all these other things and so the father i believe is in an upper room of his home so so he can look out and see the son coming. I believe the father was uh, hindered in his daily work because of his feelings for his son. I believe he loved his son so much that the normal day-to-day activity, he took time out of every day to look on the horizon in the direction he saw his son leave. And the reason I believe that is because the Bible says, while the son was still a long way off, he saw him. Now, I've got windows in my home. And there's about 100 yards of driveway before you get into my home. So in order for me to see someone coming up the hill over at Highway 69 where everybody crashes when it snows half an inch, in order for me to see somebody coming up that hill, I'm going to have to be doing this. I can't be doing this. I can't be doing this. I can't be, you know, mowing the backyard. You know, I, I, can't, I can't be doing anything. I have to be doing this. And so the father is longing for this son to come home. It matters more to him than his business. It matters more to him than anything. It's, it's what he is focused on. So he's, he's a longing father. He's longing for the son to come home. He's a looking father. He's perceiving, he's, he's, his eyes are out on the horizon. Now, when he finally catches sight of him, he runs and I believe it's taught in Jewish culture, once a man in Jewish culture gets to a certain age, it's incredibly disgraceful for him to run. Because with the clothing that they had, you had to literally take the robe and pull it through your legs and tuck it down into your belt and run. And you you look kind of goofy. So for a, a, a grown, older Jewish man to run like that, it was disgraceful. But I want you to know our father is running 
to these lost people. This is his heart. He is willing to do whatever it takes to win them, to reach them, to touch them, to heal them, to bring restoration and life to them. He's willing to, uh, like Zacchaeus did. Zacchaeus was a wealthy man, but what did he do? He did something a child would do. A desperate child. He climbed a tree. He, he humiliated himself. How many of you adults have climbed a tree lately? Two of you? Yeah. Yeah, it's not, something, it's not something that most of us do. How many of you have done the monkey bars lately? How many of you know that somebody attached this gigantic person to your hands you didn't know was there? Man, I did the monkey bars the other day, and I was like, whoa, my hands are killing me. You know, who attached this big person to my hands? So God's longing. He's looking, and he's running. Now, when he gets there, what does he do? He hugs his son. Now, a lot of us, what do we want to do? Give him the five-fold ministry right upside the head. Give him the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. Bam! But that's not what our father does. He runs to us and he hugs us. And then you know what, guys? We live in kind of a weird culture and a weird time in history, but he kisses his son. And I think it's okay for men to kiss their sons. It's just how I feel. You may think it's weird or whatever, but if God can do it, I can do it. And I love my sons. My earthly sons. So, God, he's a running, hugging, running, kissing father. And in the midst of all this, he he begins to make some other decrees. He says, reinstate the boy. You know, the boy makes the, the plea for mercy. God, be merciful to me. I'm a, I'm a loser. I've messed up. I've, I've squandered my inheritance. I don't deserve anything, anything good from you. I deserve nothing. He says, bring the robe. Hey, you guys, get that fattened calf. It's time to celebrate. Now, this is the heart of God. This is God's heart. But we're not going to talk about God for now. We're going to talk about the brother. Because the brother, there's a sharp contrast between the son and the, and the father. And if you saw anything on Facebook today, I put out a little graphic of an angry bird. And I said, uh, the angry son. We're going to talk about the angry son today. And so I want us to focus in on the attitude of the son. Because I think it's critical that we understand his attitude and contrast it with the attitude of the father. Because if any of the attitude of the grouchy, angry son is in us, it's going to hinder what God wants to do in this place. And we want to make sure we preemptively deal with that. We want to deal with it before it happens so we don't have bumps in in the road and all this mess. It's just everything's just really smooth. So the father, because he won't come into the party, he begins to plead with the angry son. And the word plead means to argue in order to persuade and was, is somewhat anonymous to begging. So the father has to again humble himself to the angry son, the son that didn't leave, the son that didn't squander his wealth. He has to, he has to plead with him. Please, please, son, please come into the party. Please celebrate with me. Please, the employees are all celebrating. The neighbors are coming over. Why can't you celebrate? Why won't you come in? Why won't you have fun with us? Why won't you celebrate because your brothers come home? And the father and the angry son couldn't be much more diametrically opposed in attitude about the lost son's return. The father is ecstatic. The father is just, oh man, he he couldn't be happier that this son has come home. But the son couldn't be angrier. He couldn't be more incensed. How dare he come home? How dare he show up here? This is his attitude. This is how he feels. We want to make sure that our hearts are like the Father's. Amen? So now the son makes this statement to the Father, the angry son. He says, look. You look, Dad. Now why does this angry son tell his father to look? 
because he's implying you're blind. Dad, can't you see? Can't you see what I see? Don't you know what's happened here? Does the father know? We know. The father knows. But that angry son, he was so incensed. So the angry son holds justice to a higher level than mercy, which is one of the causes of the conflict between the angry son and the father. Now, how do you understand these two principles operate in our daily lives? Some people are very mercy motivated. Some people are, I mean, they drip mercy. Other people are justice. You know, I got a speeding ticket one time, and I looked at the assessment. How do you know the faster you go, the greater the penalty is? Did you know that? So let's say it's a 55 and you're going 75. The, the penalty... Oh, oh y'all don't speed. Oh, you're perfect. Okay. Whoa, Pastor Tony, speeder. I don't know if I want to go to this church. Yeah. So, so yeah, so you're going 75 and a 55. The penalty's less than if you were going 85 and a 55. But you know what I noticed on the ticket? You can get a ticket for going 56 in a 55. Yeah. Are you kidding me? You can get a ticket for going one mile an hour over the speed limit. You know what, though? Most police officers don't seem to pull you over for that. Because everybody says, you can go three over. Or some people say, you can go five over. And some people say, you can go seven over. And blah, 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 blah. You know, and everyone's got their own different interpretation of how much mercy these individual police officers are going to extend to you because of your speeding. I'm here to tell you, the law says if you go one over, boom, take it. You sure can. So some people are mercy motivated. Other people want justice. The Bible says mercy triumphs over judgment. The Bible also says if you want mercy, you better extend it. Now can I tell you what? I've received mercy from my Heavenly Father. Now maybe you were perfect. I was not. I was a rank sinner. I deserved wrath and judgment from God. But can I tell you what happened? He showed me mercy. He showed me kindness and love and accepted me and died for me before I even knew what was going on. And he demonstrated that love at the cross. So now, how should I be? Should I be Mr. Justice and throw down if you make a mistake? Oh, you made a mistake. I'm going to get you. I'll show you I got a justice gift. You know what? If that's how you are, that's what you're going to get. Now, I'm not condoning sin. The Bible already judges that. Just because if I mention the scripture that talks about the sin, that doesn't make me the judge. I'm just trumpeting the, the, the true judge. He's already judged it. It's already in his word. Just because I mention it doesn't make it so. It already is. I'm just pointing, pointing you to what's already there. The judgment's already there from God. You can't judge me. I'm not. God already did. Just telling you what it says. And do take it personally. Don't take it personally. All right. So let's look at some more information about the, the angry son. Because he makes a statement here that I think will help us really understand his paradigm and how he works and serves and operates and how he relates with his heavenly father because I think it may speak to some of us today. He says this. This is a direct quote from the angry son. All these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. So what does that mean to the angry son? My anger is justified. This is my justification for being angry. I am not like him. I have done everything you ever asked me to do. I have never done wrong. I have never disobeyed your orders. So we need to talk about ministry paradigms for a minute. Because I've been in the ministry, vocational ministry, since 1995. 
I've made a living from the gospel since 1995. I don't know, it's 2013. You can do the math, figure out how long that is. Before that, I was a volunteer in a church, and, and I served the, the, the ministry. I, I just helped out, did whatever I could. And uh, in the ministry, sometimes we can, in, in vocational or non-vocational ministry, sometimes we can approach God like the angry son. Sometimes we can approach God and say, Sir, I'm reporting for duty. I'm here to follow your orders, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, we go out and do our duty. We go out and do what we're told. Like good little soldiers. Like good little obedient slaves of God. But I'm here to tell you, if you do that for a while, your flesh is going to crawl. It's going to start to just... You're going to get so bitter and so angry and so rebellious, you're going to be really angry. It's going to make you angry. If you have to walk the religious line. Now, I'm, I'm not advocating lawlessness. Hear me out. But what I am saying is this angry son was serving God as a slave. This was his mentality. I'm a slave. Dad, I'm your slave. I'm going to do whatever you say. I'm going to do it. You know, and that, that was how he was wired, and that was how he was thinking, and that was how he was living. And I believe we shouldn't serve God as slaves or soldiers if we want to do it with joy. If you want to serve God with joy, you got to take off your soldier hat and go get in the play box and get your lunch pail and be a son or a daughter. Everything the Father has is ours. And this is what the angry son forgot. This is what the angry son let escape from his understanding. Because the Father says, Son, what are you doing? How did you get so angry? Everything I have is yours. So when you were slaving for me and you were working your little tail off and going home and crying and being all grumpy and bitter and angry about how nobody appreciates you and wah, 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 it's yours. This is all yours. The other guy lost his. It's yours. He could have been in the father's house eating fattened calf every day of the week. It's his. But that wasn't how he was thinking. He was thinking, I'm going to do my duty. I'm going to serve as a slave in my father's house. He's my master and I'm his slave. That was his ministry paradigm. Now, there is a way to serve God completely under the law, and it brings death. And it's dry, and it will make you grumpy, and it will make you hard to deal with. It, you won't be any fun. You'll be, you'll be miserable to be around because you'll be super legalist. I know a little bit about what I speak of. Romans 8, 14 and 15 says this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the what? Okay, sons and daughters of God. The word translated sons is literally both. Children is the better translation. Children of God. So if you're led by the Spirit of God, you're children of God. If you're not led by the Spirit of God, but you're walking in perfect obedience, you are a slave. And your angry, grumpy, bitter attitude will radiate out of you. I'll tell you a little story. I was a young believer in Jesus, and I got saved and delivered. But I didn't get saved for my haircut, and I didn't get saved for my earring. Really. I had, I had long hair, and I had an earring. And I loved Jesus. Uh, Elizabeth, I'm coming to get you. Did he really say that? Can people with long hair love Jesus? Yeah. I could, and I did. So I go to youth camp. And I've got young people in my care 
that I am working with. And, I mean, our guys, we were, I think we were the Navy Blue team, and we were developing cheers at the lunch table. We were setting the standard for, whoa, we're going to win this camp. We're going to do good. We're going to serve Jesus. I mean, we were just going full out. And a blessed saint of God approached me in the cafeteria and said, you're mixing too much of the world with the church. And it surprised me. And I said, can you explain to me what you mean by that? She walked off. Now look, I know you judge a tree by the fruit it bears, but sometimes our hearts change faster than our hair. Sometimes our hearts change faster than our tattoos. Last time I checked, you can't change a tattoo. I mean, you can rub lemon juice and salt and all that painful stuff. So we want to serve God by the Spirit. Can I tell you one thing? The Spirit and the law are in agreement. God wrote the law. God made it. So the Spirit and the law are in agreement. So when we serve God by the Spirit, we fulfill the law. Isn't that awesome? But we don't serve God under the law, subjugated to it, because no one can. No one could. No one did. Everyone failed. Everyone said, hey, are you righteous? No. Are you? No. Let's just keep faking it. Okay. You people over there, I'm going to tie up heavy loads on your back and make you do this and make you do that. Ha, ha, ha. I'm, I'm a righteous Pharisee. I'm righteous. I've, I've achieved righteousness by the law. Ha, ha, ha. I got news for you. None of them did. Not a one. So, let's read on here in Romans 8, 14. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves. Isn't that good? The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. That's so cool. That's so much better. You know, when I went home, from college, and I opened the refrigerator, I never asked permission to eat. You know why? Because I was a son. That's my house. I don't have to ask permission to eat food on my own refrigerator. Now, parents, whose refrigerator, who bought the refrigerator? Wasn't me. Who bought the food? It wasn't me. But because I was a son, I felt entitled that when I went home, I didn't have to ask permission to use the bathroom. I didn't have to ask permission to go into the refrigerator. It was all mine. And I'm here to tell you today that we need to have the mentality of a son and a daughter. And if we're walking under the Spirit, we'll be free to serve God in the new and living way of the Spirit. All right, 1 John 4, 17 and 19 says this, In this world we are to be like Jesus. Excuse me, in this world we are like Jesus. Then he goes on in verse 18, There is no fear in love. How many of you know there's there's a... paradigm of understanding God as a a judge. There's a paradigm of understanding God as as a as as a God that pours out wrath and judgment and crushes civilizations and all these kinds of things that happen in the Old Testament. But I'm here to tell you if that's your paradigm of living and serving today in the New Testament church, you are going to be stunted in your spiritual growth. If you are walking around waiting for God to zap you because of the latest bad thing that you did, i got news for you. He's not going to zap you, and your fear of him is going to keep you from the very solution to the problem that you have. He is not going to zap you. So there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love be loved because he first loved us I don't know about you but I've learned over the years I don't know first thing about love if it wasn't for him my natural inclination self selfish but with Christ in my heart he's teaching me how to really love be selfless all right so the argument could be made that the angry son's relationship with his father was unhealthy the angry son had a misperception of his father's heart and because of this misperception It's put him into bondage for many years. 
you know, when I deal with, how many of you know we deal with conflict? And I, I have a saying, I believe it's true. And the saying is this, your perception is your reality. Now, that doesn't mean your perception is reality. Some people live that way. Everything I think is. It just is because I think so. And I'm the God of the universe. But I'm here to tell you, your perception is not necessarily what is true. And I want to open our minds to that possibility that sometimes we may have a, a certain color of glasses on that taints and changes our perception of reality and we believe a lie consistently because of these glasses that we don't know we're even wearing. And I believe the angry son had a set of those babies on his whole life, ever since the other son left, maybe before the other son left. Our perception is our reality, but our perception isn't necessarily reality. Jesus said, when the eye becomes darkness, how great is that darkness. We should always serve God out of the overflow of what he's doing in our hearts during our relational quiet time. If we begin to draw out of the principle that he's invested into our hearts for us, we may find ourselves spiritually bankrupt, grumpy, grouchy, angry, and bitter at those around us, especially those in authority, much like the angry son we see in Luke 15. The ironic thing is that the father never did anything wrong in his relationship to the son. The son, however, is carrying bitterness that easily could have been corrected had the son just spoken with the father, telling him his intimate feelings. Look, if you're angry at God, tell him. You're not going to freak him out. He's God. If something hasn't gone your way in life and you've got issues with it, tell him. You know, go into the Psalms and read some of David's prayers. If you want to hear some honest, heartfelt prayers, God, smite the teeth of my enemies. I mean, David could pray some honest, authentic prayers. But this angry son, oop, he never has a conversation with his father like that. He never says, Father, I'm tired. He never says it. He keeps the mask on. I'm not tired. I can do this. I can keep I can do this. I got this. And he's tired. He's, he's wearing down. He's breaking down. He's becoming angry. He's becoming bitter. You think this guy was fun to work with? I bet you you had to do it just a certain way around this guy. Or he would he'd snap. You missed a spot. Bah. You know, Galatians 6 and 9 tells us to not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I believe we will never become weary in well doing good if we're doing what God tells us to do. You know, Jesus said this, My burden is easy and my yoke is light. Come unto me and learn of me. I'm meek and humble at heart. If you're burned out, stressed out, freaking out, tired, bitter, angry, can I tell you something? You're not obeying Jesus. You're doing something else. And it might be valid or good in some senses of the word. People might judge it as great and glorious and wonderful, but you're not obeying Jesus. And his presence is fullness of joy. So this is why I believe Mary is commended and Martha is rebuked in Luke chapter 10. Eventually I see Mary being more effective in expressing God's kingdom than Martha. Mary was taking the time to receive, and that time is always maximized by the Holy Spirit and expressions of God's kingdom to the world around the person on the receiving end. So uh, we must be relational with the Father. We must love Him and serve Him as sons and daughters, not as slaves. How many of you know the Bible says what's done in secret will be shouted from the rooftops? You know, when I've read that, I've always thought, oh no, somebody's going to find out I... I had, I had sinned. It's, it's God's going to embarrass me. God's going to shout it from the rooftops. What a bad person I've been. You know what? This passage isn't talking about that. It says when you go into your room and you shut the door and you pray to your heavenly father, not your heavenly slave master, but your heavenly father, he sees what's done in secret and he will shout it from the rooftops. Isn't that cool? 
It's not about busting you out for some kind of sin. It's about proclaiming the cool things that God is doing in your life in prayer. God can totally set you on fire and change your life. But he hates sin. Don't get me wrong. He hates it. All right, so we're supposed to, according to Romans 7, 6, we're supposed to serve in the new and living way of the Spirit. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Okay, so let's say we get new people coming in. They're broken. They're hurting. They're needing life. They're needing a, a, a glass of cool water. We meet them at the door and say, are you righteous? Are you walking in holiness? Well... I don't know the answer to the question, but I don't think that's the right approach. I think we need to say, welcome home. Let's let the Holy Spirit do all the convicting. Yeah. Can I tell you, the Holy Spirit is the master convictor. Yes. The Holy Spirit can get into our hearts and speak to us and just break us down like no other person could ever dream. Any drill sergeant couldn't hold a candle to what the Holy Spirit can do to convict a man's heart and bring change, real change to his personality and life. And I believe the thief comes in order to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said that he has come that we may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance. I'm here to tell you today, we need joy. I believe there are Christian leaders out there that will subjugate people and put them under the law in a local church. And they will put restrictions and laws and rules on people. And I think some people can step up like a good little soldier in that culture and environment and do well for a season. But I believe that eventually the rubber band that's attached to their sinful nature will snap them back. They will snap into a life of sin. They'll snap into the true identity that has never been re renewed because they're in the wrong system. They're still under the law. As a matter of fact, I believe some of you may have been in those systems. Some of you may uh, have been in a system or a culture in a local church where you may have started out wanting to do something in joy, but you find yourself trapped, couldn't get out of it couldn't quit, didn't like it anymore, didn't have any joy about it. No one else was there to do it, so you just kept doing it. I want us to be free. Can I tell you why I'm the preacher at Jubilee Family Church? I love it. I love you. I'm serious. You know, the failure rate or the quitting rate of pastors in America today, it's like unbelievable. Pastors bail out of the ministry left and right. You know why? It's hard sometimes. But can I tell you what? The success or failure of this ministry has very little to do with me. It has a whole lot to do with God. And so I can rest in that. And I can, man, it's, it's awesome. It's fun. For me. And I can get around other pastors, man. I can tell. Oh, man, they're in the angry brother camp, you know. They're the angry guy. And they can't get the people to do what he wants them to do. I can't get the people to do what they're supposed to do. It's frustrating. Can I tell you what? I'm not even trying. I'm not. And you know what? I'm free as a bird. But I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to convict you. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And I'm trusting you to listen. I, I can't do this any other way. I refuse to do it any other way. I refuse to give you the list of what you can and cannot do. Blah, 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 blah. You better not. I don't want you to be a slave. If you want to quit, quit. You're not doing a good job anyway. You're under the law. You don't have any joy. You're destroying something. You're not helping it. If you want to quit, quit. But you know what? I believe... God wants to put things in our hearts that we say, God, use me. 
Here I am, God. Use me, use me, Jesus. I want to glorify you. I want to serve you. I want to lay down my life. I want to give up my dreams, my ambitions. It's all about you. And this comes out of our hearts, not out of a manual, some kind of instructional manual on how to be passionate about God. So be free. Be free. Free to love Jesus. You won't obey him if you don't love him anyway. You just can be grouchy and grumpy. You might as well love him and be free. I'm free. And I want to stay free. And I want you to be free. You know why? Because people in bondage are coming. And if I'm in religious bondage and they're in drug bondage, huh, do you think religious junk is going to help somebody who's addicted to crack or methamphetamines? They don't need religious junk. They need Jesus. They need a father-son, father-daughter relationship with the living God. You took my parking place, new person. Oh, dear Jesus, help us. If that's what we do, help us. We need to rejoice that they took our parking place. We need to rejoice that they took our chair. We need to rejoice that they're coming with heaven, in agreement with God and all of heaven. Party time, man. It's party time. Yes. Yes. Oh, well, I can't. Oh, you need to get with the Father. You need to have a little talk with the Father. Talk to Him. If you're bitter, if you're angry. Can I tell you? I've been there, man. I've been so legalistically... I don't even want to say righteous in my own mind. Self-righteous. It's disgusting. Can I tell you what, though? I was miserable. It's no fun at all. But in Jesus, it's fullness of joy. So let's have fun. Let's do it the right way. It's not, it's, I'm, not, I'm not advocating something that's not biblical. Let's serve Jesus and have fun doing it. Let's just love him. Amen? We've been to the altar today, but I want to come back. I want to invite you to come back. Maybe today you'd say, Pastor Tony, I've been a, a little bit like the angry, the angry son. I've been a little bit like that. I've been a little bit harsh, been a little bit critical, a little bit judgmental. And I want to have God's heart. I want to, be, I want to have mercy triumph over judgment. And again, I'm not here to talk down to you or anything like that, but I just want to help you. I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to be people of joy. And it's not frivolous, silly, <laughs> joy. It's joy because of what Jesus did. It's joy because we're free in Him. It's joy because we obey the law by the Spirit. We do the right stuff. Not because we're trying to do the right stuff, but because the laws of God are written on our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Oh, look, I, my heart wants to do the right thing. That only happens with a father-son, father-daughter relationship. It won't happen under the law. You'll just be frustrated. So if you'd like prayer, I'd like you to invite you to come to the front. I'm going to pray, and I just ask you to come. Father, in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, for joy. And we thank you, God, for these stories about how you rejoice that the sons and the daughters come home, that you go after them, you reach out to them, you pursue them. And, Lord, I ask you to help us to not be like the angry son, not to be a son that's bitter, grouchy, grumpy, frustrated, angry. But, God, we'll, we'll trust you, we'll love you have that father son father daughter relationship with you where there's fullness of joy in jesus name amen amen well i bless you i bless you let's have fun doing it the right way amen see you at life group tonight god bless you